Hey guys, Victoria here and welcome back to my channel. In today's video, I'll be sharing all my tips on how to get A plus for physics in SPM, all my last minute tips and also the important things that you need to take note of. So before we start, um, for those of you who take physics, I'm guessing you take NMATS as well. So along with physics video today, I have posted NMATS video as well. So after you watch this one, make sure you go watch that one. So now we'll proceed with today's video. My first tip when it comes to physics is to really know all your formulas. Um, everything in physics is really based off of formulas. All the concepts are derived from formulas. For example, for the formula um, F equals to PA, P equals to F over A. The definition of pressure is simply force per unit area. So if you know the formulas, life will just be really easy for you. If you don't know the definition of pressure, but you can write down P equals to F over A, and then you know that that divider means per unit, then you can easily know that pressure is force per unit area. As simple as that. Everything in physics is really derived out of formulas. So if you have been watching my videos for quite some time now, then you would know that I have two videos already. One video on the complete list of Form 4 formulas for physics and one video for the complete list of Form 5 formulas. Both videos will be linked in the description box below in case you have never heard or watched that video before. But those are the list of complete formulas. Um, I even explained some of the formulas and how you can apply that and stuff. So definitely go watch that video if you need um, a grasp of the formulas. And after I posted those two videos, a lot of you guys have actually asked me if I memorized all the formulas and you're like, what? How is it possible to memorize all the formulas? The answer is I don't force myself to really memorize all the formulas. Like I don't study the formulas like I study bio. I don't um, just memorize it. But as I do a lot of exercises and when those formulas come to practice, I can know it. Like I do read that list of formulas. So that it's in the back of my head. And when I go through questions, I will list down the readings that are given and the units and values that are given. Um, it will be a long question and they will give you all the information that you need and don't need as well. So you're going to pick out the information that you really need from there. And let's say they say that pressure is 450 PA. So you're going to write down P equals to 450. And then um, they give you the force as well. So you're going to write F equals to 200 N. And then they ask for the area. So from the force and pressure, you're going to find the area. And you have to list down A equals to what. And by looking at those three things, P and F and A, you're going to try to recall which formula comprises all of these three units. So if you keep a list of formulas that you go through every now and then, just read through and familiarize yourself with those formulas, then it would be extremely helpful. Because once you see those P and F and A, you link it together and you'll be like, oh, the formula is P equals to F over A. So you're going to apply that formula and get the answer. As simple as that. So formulas are really important in conclusion. So go and get those formulas in, watch those videos to help you. And just try to grab as many formulas as you can. Also a fun fact is that I use acronyms to memorize formulas as well. Those formulas that I find really difficult to memorize, I would just use acronyms to memorize them. For, for example, for the formula um, F equals to PA, why can I still memorize it after so long? It's because I have an acronym for that and it's like FRIA equals to personal assistant. So FRIA is a name of a person and personal assistant is just like a post personal assistant. So I remember it as FRIA equals to personal assistant. That's why I can remember it all the way till today. And then from that formula, I just derive P equals to F over A. So it's not necessary that you have to memorize the core formula. Because the core formula here is P equals to F over A. But maybe you can memorize it in some other forms. Because whenever you think that F equals to P A, you will know that P equals to F over A as well. So it's you can make things easier for yourself sometimes if you can memorize the formula in this form better and you know that from this form you can easily derive to get another form then you can memorize it in that form and also like use acronyms whenever you can Priya equals to personal assistant F equals to PA as simple as that Number two is exercises 
so for physics whenever i study physics i just noticed that i can get through all of that pretty fast um it is not difficult to go through physics and study physics and the main way that i learn physics is by doing exercises a huge part of physics is actually the formulas you have to know how to get the values from the formulas and then there is a part on essays as well but for both the doing exercises are really the key um apart from past years you can do activity books as well by doing those questions and referring to the format you will know exactly how they want it because there is a specific format for paper 2 that you have to follow so by doing questions and especially past year questions you will know the formula so if you want to know how to study physics and for me it is just a little bit of reading and mostly exercises exercises are really really important number 3 is to use the correct physics terms and to know your definitions for physics so for physics not all definitions are important but i have noticed that there is a trend of a few frequently tested definitions and i'll tell you what it is but so i have just found a website where they shared the pdf version of the list of definitions for physics spm so i'll leave a link in the description box below so that you can go and click it and download it if you want to cuz it's in pdf version i think it's very easy to print it out but um they have the list of complete definitions and there are 176 here um well that's a lot but not everything is important i'll just like go through the list and tell you which one is more important so okay a very important one is newton's first law of motion second law of motion and third law of motion these three really really important memorize this okay and then we have momentum which is the product of mass and velocity so if you know the formula p equals to mv then you will know that the definition is product of mass and velocity there are certain definitions in physics which can be derived from the formulas which explains why the formulas are so so important okay moving on so the definition for hooke's law is quite important as well do take note of about that and then chapter 3 forces and pressure you have three principles that you have the pascal's principle bernoulli's principle and also archimedes principle those three principles are really important but their definitions are not as important as their formulas you need to know which formula applies to which principle so so for example for pascal's principle the formula is f1 over a1 equals to f2 over a2 so you need to know exactly which formula correlates to which principle then we come to chapter 4 heat heat capacity and specific heat capacity are the two like most frequently tested definitions it is always always tested and you need to know the difference between heat capacity and specific heat capacity the definitions are different so make sure that you don't get mixed up on that and you can use the formula to remember the definition as well that is one way to do it and then moving on in chapter 4 as well we have the boys law charles law and pressure law again the definitions of these three laws are not as important as their formulas you need to know that when it comes to boys law you have this formula when it comes to charles law you have this formula you need to know those formulas so i have already explained those in my list of formulas video I do mention which law belongs to which formula and stuff like that. So make sure that you go watch that. I'll just leave links in the description box below. And we have the critical angle, which is the incidence angle that produces a refraction angle of ninety degree. And this definition is important, but not in subjective. This definition is very important for objective questions. I have just seen a lot of objective questions where they give you um semicircles. and then there will be a lot of angles of incidence and refraction and they'll ask you which is the critical angle so the critical angle is the angle of incidence no matter how much it is but the angle of refraction must be 90 degree so you're going to choose the diagram in which the angle of refraction is 90 degree so that is your angle of incidence so that is what i wanted to say about critical angle if you can't understand it from my explanation because i don't have the diagram here you can go ahead and flip through your reference book and try to understand what the critical angle is 
it is super important and it might really come out in objective questions. Then there are some things which will be tested for definitions, some more important definitions, which include the Ohm's law. The definition of Ohm's law is important, take note of that. And then for Lenz law and Faraday's law, you need to know those definitions as well. And then we have um, radioactivity and isotopes. Radioactivity and isotopes are both really important definitions. Make sure that you get those definitions down. But the most important one is definitely isotopes. Frequently tested, get that formula down. Isotopes are elements which have the same proton number but different nuclear number. Remember this definition, really important. And then nuclear fusion and nuclear fission are two important definitions as well. So do take note of those two definitions as well and take note of all the definitions that I mentioned. Those are really frequently asked ones. But if you can, then go through the list of definition, the complete list, just so you know the concept. Because some of the definitions won't be asked directly, as in subjective questions, but they will be tested in objective questions. Sometimes you need to know the definitions in order to answer the questions. So I think that this full list of definitions is definitely helpful. I'll leave it in the description box below so that you can go get this list. Number five is on paragraphing and when it comes to writing essays, everyone is saying, okay, don't write in bullet points, don't use point form to write, you have to write in continuous form. But there are some examiners who prefer it if you write it in point form, but you just don't put the bullet point indicating that it is in point form. But you can start each of your point in a new paragraph. Because for SPM, it is freestyle paragraphing. You can write as many paragraphs as you want. If you want to combine everything in one paragraph, that's fine. If you want to like use one paragraph to write one point, begin each point with a new paragraph, that's fine as well. But I feel like the second one will help you, which is to begin each point with a new paragraph. This is so that the examiner can clearly identify your points. If you begin each point with a new paragraph, then it's clear, okay, this is one point, this is another point. Because the examiners have to mark a lot of papers, hundreds, hundreds of papers. So if you just cram all your points in one huge paragraph and you're running out of time during exams, so maybe your handwriting is not that nice and it's all crumpled up and maybe the examiner finds it difficult to identify the points and maybe they'll miss it, they're humans too. So if you just begin each point in a new paragraph, then it's very clear. It can clearly be seen, okay, this is one point and then this is one point. But if you don't want to use one paragraph for one point, you can combine several points into one paragraph as well. Just don't make your paragraph too long or too big that, because then it will be intimidating to read that. So just separate it into um, manageable paragraphs. Okay, so number six, I'm going to talk about graph. When it comes to graph, you need to label the axis properly. You have the vertical and the horizontal axis. And the horizontal axis will be your MV. Your vertical axis will be your um, RV. And you have to label those properly together with their units. Units are very important. I have said this a lot of times, but units are really very important. Make sure that you don't miss out on units. So you're going to draw the line. And um, the title is important as well. Right. And then you have to choose the correct scale for your graph. Usually the scale that you will use is 1, 2, 5, and 10. Those are the scales that are commonly used in um, drawing graphs. 1, 2, 5, and 10. Take note of that. And you're going to choose a scale that is most suitable for your graph. So you have to um, make a rough estimation and make sure that the graph takes up more than 50% of the entire paper. It's best if you can take up around 70% of the paper. Don't make your graph too small and don't exceed the graph paper provided. Just make sure that it is more than 50%. Try to use the correct scale. And then next, you're going to plot the points. You have to plot the points correctly. The examiner is going to check one by one and make sure that you plot it correctly. And there are two ways to plot a point. You can either draw an X or a dot. But what I suggest is the dot because you can correctly pinpoint which is the point. If you draw an X, it's just like confusing. I don't know, at least for me, I prefer to use dots. And you're going to draw the line, whether it's a curve or it's a straight line. Usually it's a straight line. 
and usually it will be a best fit line. It's best if you can pass through all the points in a graph, but sometimes that is not the case, and you will just have to plot a best fit line which passes through as many points as possible. If there's like two points above your line, then you are going to make sure that there's two points below your line as well. It has to be balanced. You can't have like three points above the line and then one point below the line. That is not a best fit line. Pass through as many points as possible and make sure that there is a balance between the points above and below the line. Number seven is what I have to say when it comes to drawing diagrams. Make sure that you do label your diagrams properly. Every single detail in your diagram has to be labeled. Labeling is so important because maybe you can understand what you're drawing but the examiner can't. Maybe you're drawing a square and it's meant to be a water tank but only you know that it's meant to be a water tank. You have to label it. So that the examiner will know so no matter how terrible the drawing happens to be at least you are labeling it and the examiner knows what you want to convey so yeah definitely remember to label all your diagrams number eight if you are recording values from an experiment or if you are tabulating data then make sure that um, the decimal places are consistent if it's two decimal places then make sure that everything is two decimal places and the decimal place have to be based on the smallest division of the scale of the measuring tool that you are using. Let's say the smallest division is 0 0.1, then all your decimal places will be to one decimal place, unless specified in the question. So if the question specifies that round off all your answers to two decimal places, then that will just make your life easier. Just round off everything to two decimal places, but if they don't mention it, then it depends on the measuring tool that you've been given. Based on, based on that, use the smallest division to decide your decimal place. And also, it's very important to include the units. So units are really important. Remember to write down the correct units. This is not only true for paper 3, it is for paper 2 as well. You will lose a lot of marks if you don't write those units. So those are all my last mini tips to get A plus for physics SPM. So make sure that you go get those formulas list and then go get the definition list as well. Get those things down and then just do a little bit exercises. If you've been um, doing exercises and studying physics, then it shouldn't be a difficult paper. And for those of you who take NMATS, remember to go watch my NMATS video. I shared some tips for NMATS on that video as well. So that's all for today's video. Thanks for watching and I'll see you guys in my next video.